And Steve, many of you know, is an extremely enthusiastic proponent of Scratch and Connect. And any time I have seen him, I have felt dazzled, and, but also empowered. And with no further ado at this stage, I'm going to hand you over to Steve. Thank you. Can you all hear me at the back? I don't have a microphone, so I have to shout. Fred, can you hear me? Yeah. Very good. Good morning, Ceci. I'm delighted to be here. I'm, uh, as you've just heard, this is uh, not the world's most prepared keynote because uh, I didn't do my duty. I was supposed to stay up all night preparing the keynote. And uh, I, I began to stay up all night, but then I went to bed. So. Uh, I'm very conscious speaking to all of you because you're all highly trained professional teachers and I'm not. I, I, I've been talking to Ceci since 2008 uh, and I used to always say when I began speaking that uh, I had no formal teacher training or you know, any teaching you know, skills at all so I was privileged to be speaking to you. But Max Allen, who's very good, said I'd stop saying that because once I opened my mouth it was quite obvious to everybody I had no teaching. <laughs> experience or skills. So I've been relying on technology to get me there because I didn't have the, the teaching skills and the H-tips and all those cool things that everyone else has. And as a lecturer, on my first day in the job, I'm a lecturer in the Institute of Technology in Tallaght and I lecture on computer science. And I teach first years and fourth years. I teach them how to program and then I teach them when, they're, when they've learned that, when they, they're nearly ready to graduate, how to make computer games and e-learning applications, things like that. And uh, on my first day, I was asked by my boss, who is now retired, he said, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to win and I'm going to teach. I'm going to be the best teacher ever. And he said, I did not hire you to teach. I hired you to lecture. So that put me in my place. So I said, right, from now on, I'm not going to teach. But I haven't followed my mission statement quite well. I occasionally lapse into little bits of teaching. And uh, when that happens, I think, uh, if it works, it's fantastic. We use technology though, and all of you here are using technology as a tool. And I have a slightly different aspect on it. I often don't have the latest cool iPads and tablets and all sorts of fancy software. Often I'm saying to the students, I'm not going to use this fancy software, I want you to write the software, write the computer programs to make the software, and then I will use them. Or if they're not something I would use, because maybe they're in the primary or secondary, I'll show them to Ceci. So today I'm very lucky I have uh, three groups of students, two students each, final year students who are going to be bringing their projects to show today, later on today, and they're all interactive whiteboard applications written by these students, not by me. What I'm talking about today is, is getting them to that stage. That's at fourth year, when they've already done four years of computer programming, computer science, and all those strange and weird things that you as teachers don't want to have to worry about. But to get them to that stage starts much earlier. It doesn't start in first year when they're 17 of college. It starts in primary and secondary school with you. Now, some of you are going to say, well, we don't teach computer programming, it's not in the curriculum, and it's, we don't get support for it, we're not trained to be teachers, and all of those things are correct. Some of you don't have computer rooms, you might have one computer in the corner. And I and the most important and most difficult challenge here for you is you're not computer programmers. With the exception of a few traders who did a degree in computer programming and then left my profession to become primary school teachers. You know who you are, I'm not going to name names. Sorry. But anyway, what, what we have is a fantastic ecosystem of teachers though who would introduce these fantastic concepts to the students. But they're afraid. And you're right to be afraid because we, we treat computer science and computing and computational thinking like this big, scary set of problems that you have to use big words to understand, like algorithms. <coughs> Algorithm, it sounds like uh, <laughs> So, we have an issue here that students don't like the language we use and teachers aren't trained for those students. And what it comes down to is a mindset. Rather than looking for the latest technology for you to use in your classroom, the latest apps, I want you to say to yourself, could I be making those apps? Before you say, wait, I'm not a programmer, you don't have to be a programmer. And let's see how we can do it. So, I'm not a slides person, but I made slides especially for you. Luckily, the sun is hiding. <laughs> When I was a kid, you learned to program 
out of computer magazines which are no longer sold. There are computer magazines, but they don't come with source code listing. Now, I'm an older gentleman, as you can tell, I'm 35 years old. And this is what I grew up with. And I'm not going to read it out, but I'll read out one line. In 1904, POC SC plus 1 plus 20 multiplied by Y. I put that into a set of scenario program. <laughs> if you look at it, like, that line means nothing to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that line means nothing unless you spend years in growth in it. So what students, what kids would do when they get this magazine, and this magazine was very popular, they would, uh, there was a lot of different ones depending on whether you had a Spectrum or an Atari or a Commodore. There's no looks of recognition anywhere there. <laughs> one person, who had a Spectrum? ZX 8081. Who had a Commodore VIC-20, Commodore 64? Who had the Amstrad? Well, obviously the richer end of the room. <laughs> well, I didn't know the Dragon was sold in Ireland, but yes, the Dragon? Yes. On these eight micros, if you were from Holland, you would have had a Philips that ran with a Microsoft Basic, you know? Okay, and then finally, well, I had the Atari, which was important from America. Oh, the Atari. <laughs> Now, I love my Atari 600 XL, and I learned programming typing in these weird codes like this. These codes were usually typed in verbatim by students and kids like me who didn't know what they meant. That's not how you learn to program, unless you spend 10 years doing it, and finally it will click. But that's not a good strategy. So we don't do that anymore. You can't get these magazines anymore. The internet has replaced them. But the internet's full of people who have learned how to do one thing, and they assume that means they're an expert on everything, and they browbeat you if you try to argue with them. So there's a lot of fear there if you're a young student and you want to learn to program. And, like my son's eight years old, he's learning to program. And he, he, he's got I have, I have four kids and the younger ones watch him program and they're, they're enthralled in him. But he couldn't learn from this because it would take far too long and there wouldn't be the instant feedback that our, our current generation are used to. So what we do nowadays, we don't bother with all those weird codes. We simply say, we need more programmers We've got lots of colleges. We may have a lot less soon. But we've got lots of those colleges. Let's send all our students to these colleges, whether they like it or not, so they will learn computer programming. So there's been a proliferation of very good computer programming courses. They've got various different names. I'm not going to name any of them. They're all very, very similar and very, very good. The problem is that our intake is not necessarily the right intake. It's not that students aren't capable of it. They're just the wrong students. They didn't want to be computer programmers. However, they were told it's a good career in computer programming. And if they would say to most people, what's computer programming, they wouldn't get a clear answer because who really knows what it is unless they're one of those strange people who does it. And those strange people generally don't go out to schools and talk to them about it. So I'm one of those strange people. <coughs> and what I say is don't do computer programming just because you think you'll get a good career out of it. That's not a good way to approach your third level education. Approach it because you want to learn to program. But they won't know they want to learn to program unless we've given them some experience in the schools. And that's a big ask, because now I'm asking you guys to do my promotional work for me. So we have to improve how we do it. And there's a professor in America, her name is Jeanette Wink, and she uses computational thinking as her way of expressing what I've been saying here. Can we make the students understand what, we, what the type of person we want and the type of interests we need? so that when they come into college, they're not shocked by all this new stuff. I've had students in first year of college say, I thought this was ECDL, this is not what I want. <laughs> I've had students say, oh, I really loved computers, and I used to write little programs at home, but my guidance counselor told me not to reply because uh, I didn't have honours maths. And I wouldn't get an A in honours maths if I was doing it. These are myths and perceptions which permeate our culture about computer programs. What computational thinking is trying to do is say, it doesn't have to be about maths. It doesn't have to be about, uh, are you nerdy enough to do it? It doesn't have to be only for students who sit at home playing games all day. They're probably not the students you want to encourage into the, the theory. It's about taking the student, the boy or the girl, <coughs> who has that logical mind, who maybe is on the chess team or is interested in chess, who maybe is, thinks about problems in a slightly more logical way than the next student does. That's exactly the type of student you want to encourage. But it's also the students with the creative flair. Because computer programming is not about your maths ability. It's often more about your language's ability. But it's especially about your creative ability. The best computer programmers I ever knew were not mathematicians. They were the ones that could 
think of an <coughs> unusual solution to the problem. The ones that didn't spend ages coming up with the algorithm to fix it, they said, you wouldn't have to write this one million line program if you simply drag the cable from there to there instead of trying to write the wireless bridge interface or some other completely out of the blue <coughs> solution to a problem that we approach because we're trained to approach it as a maths problem. So those creative people are in your schools right now and they're the students that I want to have and teach. So I need to give you guys some tools to show your students to find that spark to say, you know what, little Jack there, he really gets this stuff and he loves it and it's his favourite thing and nothing I present in the sound curriculum has made him interested but suddenly this has lit him up. Little Jack should be applying to study with me or one of my colleagues in the third level institutions. So, this comes down to, and I'm going to show you a programming tool to call Scratch to do this, but I try to shorten it to treat, teach the three Ds. And we have the three Rs, our reading, writing, and arithmetic. I think that comes from the 1850s or thereabouts. The three Ds to me are design, develop, and debug. Now, I accidentally came up with this on Fred Boss's excellent Ed Chat IE one night, uh, so I've been trying to remember it ever since. Designing programs is something anyone can do with a pen and paper, and they don't have to be programmers. Um, Ian Roller, I can't see where Ian is. Ian Roller has an excellent talk today about using flowcharts for designing <coughs> programs. We have the ideas here don't have to be based in software. Designing computer programs are solutions to problems you have. It could be a problem you have in the classroom. Development is where the computers come in. Make me a tool which makes my life easier. Seamus O'Neill there has showed me fantastic flash programming tools for interactive whiteboards. I said to my students, make that work on an iPad, and they went and did it. When you get resources like that, the ideas have to come in. You're developing creative solutions to problems that you have in the classroom. What's the problem you have in the classroom that you'd like a computer program or an app to make your life easier? And it could be something like Simon is doing. Uh, I can't see where Simon is. Or Simon is doing where an apps where a parent who's queuing in the bank can find out info about what's on in their school and what's happened. These are all solutions to problems that some of you have, not all of you have, but that your students could be coming up and developing a solution. And then debugging. Why do we throw the debugging? Well, believe it or not, there is a problem in, in most software. If you've ever used a computer, you'll notice that they don't always work the way you want them to. And you get crashes and problems. The debugging process is often the learning step. The step where they say, well, I created this brilliant program. And you say, well, is there any problems with it? And the first thing a student will do is deny there's any problems with their program. And you say, does it always work perfectly? And, well, not quite. Well, what doesn't work? Well, sometimes, if, unless you're standing on one foot, the program will crash. And you say, well, fix that. Oh, I can't. And the question you must ask as an educator is, well, what did you try? How, how did you try to fix it? Oh, I tried everything. And I, when, I, when I get four years saying this at college level, I say, well, tell me one thing you tried. You tried everything. And they can't think of it. If it didn't work, it must be broken. So the debugging process, the going in and fixing your program or your creation, that is actually a critical part of the learning process. Because anyone can uh, throw together a, a painting and say, yeah, that's the sun there, and uh, that's a mountain, and that's a tree. And you say, well, it kind of looks more like you know, a horse sitting on a cabbage. They can debug that picture. They may need to completely redo it. But the learning process is there. The output that they have given you is not what was expected. And debugging, even though that's using a computer term, I think that's where the learning really happens. So how can you introduce this to your own classroom? Well, as in my, uh, when Adrian introduced me, she mentioned Scratch. Scratch is a fantastic tool, and it doesn't get enough love. You have to love a tool that looks like a Fisher Price. It's got lovely sort of Lego bricks. They're actually designed Lego bricks. They click together. You're all familiar with Lego. A few people not familiar with Lego. The people who aren't familiar with Lego, you need a hug. <laughs> Parents need an intervention. You need to write to Santa and demand answers. Lego is so simple. I give Lego to all my kids, and you know, in fairness, you know, two engineers, we have hopes. And uh, <laughs> we say to them, what are you going to make? Now, I don't believe in the Lego that's Harry Potter Lego. And it's, I don't know, what's the Hagrid's motorbike in Harry Potter. And that's all it can build. Because my kids never build the excitement. They want to make something else. Lots of fun with that. And that's what I want. I want to see what they'll create. 
When I try to get them to make it better, they say, no, no, Daddy, that is what it's meant to be. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Scratch is like that. Scratch does not dictate to you the order you connect the bricks together. What it allows you to do is connect all these funny-looking Lego bricks. And these Lego bricks control this funny-looking guy over here, what we call our stage. And that cat on the stage is a sprite. And a sprite is just a computer program term meaning something that you can see. So we put these bricks together, and they all give different commands to our sprites. So it's aimed at about ages seven or eight up, but it has been used with younger bricks. I started, I went to brilliant Coder Dojo. Who's been to Coder Dojo? Get yourself to Coder Dojo, it's brilliant. I brought my eight year old to the drop of the one. And uh, my eight year old Jack is brilliant, he's very smart, but he's just not, he's not great at social sort of activities. So I didn't tell him I'd bring him to Coder Dojo. <laughs> I said I was calling in here and would he help me? And he wondered why I was bringing a laptop with me, but as soon as he was there, there was 50 other kids, there was silence in the room, they were all programming in Scratch. Jack said, Scratch, that's the thing you do, Daddy, that you showed me. And I said, yes, Jack, would you like to have a go? Because if I had made it a big deal that he was going to this, there's just no way. I wouldn't get him out of the car. He sat and programmed for the three hours. I mean, he made Sonic a Hedgehog. It was incredible. He just loved it. When he got home, his younger siblings um, watched him for a while, and Rose did have this amazing what he was doing. He was just making a Sonic that he had drawn run around the screen. But the others got fed up after a while, and they went into the living room to watch some cartoons, and I said, Jack, you've been on that all day. You know, why don't you go on and watch some cartoons? And he said, Daddy, I'm programming. <laughs> so, uh, when Scratch, in just a short exposure, can turn your eight-year-old into a kid who just wants to read all day and maybe do some maths for fun into a programmer, well then, I'm getting something. So, how does it work? Well, as I said, you sprites and you can and I'm going to, with you, we're going to make a computer program in Scratch right now. And it's a very simple computer program. But some of you, it's the most complex computer program you've ever written or seen written. So I'm going to go into Scratch here. Can you all still hear me down the back? Yes. That person can't hear me because didn't know what I said. <laughs> so, so there's my cat, and I know the sun is on the screen, I'm dragging that cat around there. See? And I'm going to drag some bricks. So over here, I have a control brick. When green flag clicks, which is equivalent to saying when the program runs. I'm going to drag in forever, which is a loop if you're a programmer. And I'm going to drag over uh, an if statement. An if statement in programming is what we would call Boolean logic from a court number. And storage bool. And what we say here is if something happens, do this. In this case, something happens as a key being pressed. So what I want to say is if the right key is pressed, I want my little cat there to move right. So when I express that to you in English, not in programming, but because I use the critical term if, that's actually a concept that we teach to all computer programming students in the college. And it takes weeks to go through every possibility of an if statement. Whereas you guys have just learned it, and that took me about 10 seconds to say. So I'm going to click on sensing now, and drag it out. <coughs> Key, space, press, and that's the right arrow. So can you see? It's very hard to see that, I'm sorry. But see, if key, right arrow, press, is that visible? Just about? Oh, sorry. Thanks. So if key, right arrow, pressed, then I'm going to click on motion and move 10 steps. So my entire program so far contains a section to run, a loop, and an if statement, and it senses key pressed. It also makes my character move. I haven't typed a single letter yet. I have just clicked and dragged. So I'm going to click run, and I'm going to maximize the screen so you can see it. And I'm going to press the right arrow key now. Now, all of you could have written that program. And if you go to a workshop today with Claire McInerney, she'll teach you to write that program. Now, I'm also going to show you just how easy it is. I'm going to duplicate there, select left arrow, Add in a point in direction command. And again, these are all English sounding words. So I have point in direction right and left. I'm going to click run. And I'm pressing the right and left keys. And again, I've yet to type anything. And I've made the basics of Super Mario. <laughs> and then finally, he lives in a, in a very unpleasant place. It's all white. And we're going to import a nice background. We'll put them in the desert, that looks nice. So, again, I've yet to type anything, and I have a cat running around the desert. 
So Scratch is an amazing computer programming tool for kids that can be used to make games, can be used to make interactive art, and can be used to make little multimedia programs. I've seen someone try to, a teacher, and one of the courses we do, try to recreate Hamlet in it. That was probably a bit much in the first go, but it was quite impressive. So, it's not enough. And it's sad to say that. It's not enough. Just because we have all these fantastic commands built into Scratch, I think the problem that most of our students face today is that content is no longer the aim of most of the devices they buy and you give them to use. So hopefully all the people down the back can hear me now. If you buy an iPad, you can get fantastic apps, but most of them aren't designed for content creation. Some of them are, but mostly it's content consumption. And they're fantastic fun, but you buy an Xbox, you don't make games on an Xbox, unless you're a professional developer. You buy games for the Xbox and play them. PSPs, Nintendo DSs, Nintendo Wiis, PlayStation 3s, they're all content consuming devices. And we've moved quite far away from Here's a fantastic thing you can use to make stuff. That's what a personal computer used to be if you got one. Now it's something to, you know, it doesn't even come with a compiler anymore. Why would you want one of those? Buy some apps that we've made for you. So Scratch is a change into let's make making something on your computer new and cool. Unfortunately, you've just seen my little Scratch cat there, and most of your students probably wouldn't be that impressed. Some of them would, a lot of them wouldn't. So, last Christmas, 12 months, Santa Claus came and he brought this Microsoft Kinect here. And if you've used the Kinect on your Xbox, you've jumped around with it and played with it and it's great fun. And I decided to hack it for Scratch. And I wrote a program, I released it for free, it's had thousands of downloads all over the world, and I'm going to show that to you now. Xbox you've played with them, but for those of you who are new to it, 
this is my little program running here. See, it's detecting my skeleton. And I'm going to send the data there over to Scratch. So we're back here to Scratch. Now, I know you got the world's shortest introduction to Scratch. Sorry about that. But it was just so you could know what Scratch was. So here's another Scratch program, one that I wrote earlier. And you'll see my decapitated Scratch cat. And in real time, I'm programming in Scratch, and it's in, I'm interacting with a Scratch program that I've written, and every red dot there is a joint in my body it's tracking. So what Connect to Scratch gives us, which is this little program here, is, well, what it's given me is the chance to give for free, the free software, to students all over the world. And I'm going to show you just how some of them are using it. Usually they make games and interactive art with it. I'm going to show you uh, one game. See my two hands? Yeah, I'm just moving my two arms up and down. And I want you to see how easy that program is to write. Now, it's going to be hard to see it, but the program says, when the program starts, move the left paddle to the left-hand side of the screen. Then forever, stay on the left-hand side of the screen, but change your y-axis by the y-axis position of your left-hand's y-value. If you don't know what x and y is, you're, A, you're not a maths teacher, B, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, as you're moving your hand up and down, it's tracking that in real time. That's one, two, three, four lines. The right hand paddle is another four lines with the word hand left changed to hand right. So not much of a change. And then finally, the ball is slightly more complicated because I have random bounce off angles, which uses a built-in command to pick random. Again, you could shorten that, but I leave it long enough that students can understand it. All in all, there's no typing involved in that entire program. When Pong originally came out, it was millions of lines long in assembly. So that was back before I was born, so I'm not responsible for that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try Space Invaders, but I'm not as sure I have enough room. But it's just to show you that it can be tracking multiple points. So my head is the spaceship. <laughs> my hands above my head fires a missile. <laughs> that I lost a lot of weight before this talk. <laughs> And again, the longest part of making that program was drawing the baddies, because I'm not very good at drawing. So, I now want to show you uh, very quickly, it doesn't have to be games. Now, I'm going to plug in sound for this, so this might be a bit loud. of my fifth class recorder teacher. Um, I inherited a grand piano. It looks nice. I don't know how to make it do anything. But I can write a program in 13 lines of scratch which plays music based on where my hands are in terms of tempo and pitch. I don't know what tempo and pitch mean, but they're built into scratch. When you can do that and have... I'm going to show you a video now. That's the same program. Sorry, I'm showing the wrong one. This comes from Australia. And in this program, there's a girl in the library playing my music program. I don't, it's very hard to see. 
There's no training required to use these programs. You don't hold a controller. You don't have to do anything. You make music just by moving your hands, and it's a short program. The important thing is that they write the program, not that you give them to. You're not giving them the app, they're making the app. You're saying make it so it works with the piano instead. She's having great fun there, jumping up and down and everything. You can watch all these on YouTube. That's from Lucy Barrow in Australia. And uh, the Japanese seem to have taken it on the most. There's a very cute little kid being a giant robot here. And again, it's all using my software, so it's great to see it happening. But uh, the best one is an email I got from... And I'm just going to leave this playing with the sound off while I talk over it. This came in from Japan, where they did a girls workshop. And it was to promote technology in schools, so they got um, some sort of uh, high school level girls in, and the, the, they got lots of connects, and the whole project was about using them. I'm actually hoping to meet the five Japanese researchers and lecturers who did it at the Scratch conference um, in July. But I had no input to this. I just wrote the software, and they put up the video you know, five months ago and sent me a link to it. And I think it's, it's brilliant to see free software that you develop for your kids for fun being used in schools in Japan. Like, who'd have thought it, you know? But, but I'm just going to switch back to the final couple of slides. There is one, one issue. Sadly, I don't get a lot of downloads from Ireland. It is improving. I had about five downloads from Coder Dojo Limerick. So I don't know who was responsible for that, but I can guess. <laughs> but I've just put up on the slide there, that was one month's downloads last November, and I highlighted all the Irish downloads. Uh, Ireland Navin, Ireland Dublin, Ireland Cork. Five out of 100, which is not great. And the software is free. The hardware costs 150 quid, but many people have it as part of their Xbox setup. So that's, that's a little sad. So I hope some of you will download it. There was one, there was one video that I don't have here. If, I don't know if the teacher's here, but last year I showed this to a teacher at Sassy, and on the way home they stopped at Tesco and bought a Connect. And then they sent me a video of their kids in a remote school out in Sligo or Mayo, and it was fantastic. It was unbelievable. Uh, I don't know if uh, the teacher's here. Is the teacher here? Who did that? No. They're not going to admit it anyway. Uh, but definitely, if you can use this, please do. But how can you learn Scratch? How can you get into it? Well, Lero, uh, Claire McInerney, I don't know if Claire is here, but she's going to be here later on. She runs fantastic courses all over Ireland through ICS, NCTE, and they're really supportive and they're brilliant. If you can get onto a course like that, do. They're usually quite short. You get to see how to make Scratch programs yourself, and they're aimed at primary and secondary. Come to Scratch Day, please. Uh, now, it's very hard to say this because Pamela O'Brien is in the room, but if you're not going to ICT and Education Conference on May 19th, please go to Scratch Day on May 19th. Scratch Day is an international day, I don't pick it, so sorry about that. But the Scratch competition, the closing date is 11th of March this year, but it's aimed at primary schools, there's money to be won. Claire McInerney organises it, it's kindly supported by the ICS, and you should really, really, really come along, even if you're not in the competition, and just see Scratch. It's an IT talent in Dublin. So, a few websites there, but the last one there is my website where you get software for free. ITT Dublin, whereas I work, uh, it's IT Tala, and we will uh, help you if we can, especially if you're a local school, because we'll go out to you if you're a local school and show you the stuff. SESI, of course, NCTE, and uh, scratch.ie if you want to learn a bit more. And that's the end. In closing, um, Scratch. I've never seen any programming tool so easy to use to galvanize kids so quickly. It's amazing. They really get into it, they love it. Anyone who's been to Coder Dojo and use Scratch will tell you it's amazing how quickly they're into it. There's one final thing I want to tell you. There's a really cool project some of you might know about called Mission V. Anyone know about Mission V? I'm in the middle of trying to integrate the Connect into OpenSIM, which is like Second Life. I'm not supposed to have done it yet. But uh, we are making progress, is all I would say. And for me personally, it's great to be able to tell you all about it. I'm, I'm in the middle of trying to um, close a book deal on writing a scratch book. So it's fantastic to be able to share this stuff with you. If anyone wants 
to learn more about Scratch, Connect or anything like that, I'm here all day, please grab me and talk to me. And if you think you'd like to try it, please do. The more Scratch we can get in the classroom, the more students coming out knowing what computer science is, and the easier my job will be at college. <laughs> Thank you very much. Follow that if you dare. Uh, I can only say thank you very, very much again to Stephen. Um, as somebody who just introduced Scratch this year with my transition years, I can confirm what he said in terms of the student who perhaps you didn't think would take to it takes to it very, very well. A student who perhaps wouldn't recognise in themselves any logical abilities or anything like that, and we have certainly done well. But now, I can see what I'm going to be doing this summer is getting proficient, so that next September, it'll be movement all the way. So, thank you very much again, Stephen, for that.